Thank you, Beryl Elites, and thank you for everyone who's made it today, despite, uh, uh, I guess, partly holiday day uh, and uh, bad traffic, as we know. Um, one of our, uh, actually, uh, discussions is still struck in traffic. He might be joining us a few minutes later. So, um, I will be moderating this panel. I will confess, I know very little about private equity. Um, I'm myself a quant, but I'm a generalist. Uh, I uh, basically moderate a lot of uh, uh, general research papers in various aspects of investment strategies. So it is with that kind of view that I will try to moderate today's panel, but luckily we have uh, a lot of great uh, expertise on the panel. So uh, with that, uh, perhaps we'll do a quick round of uh, uh, self-introductions, uh, and, and then we'll jump into uh, into the discussion itself. Uh, Lamy? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Lamy Ajibisin. I'm a managing director and the transaction advisory services practice leader at Anchin. So my practice focuses on providing financial due diligence, uh, tax diligence, tax structuring to financial investors such as private equity funds, uh, banks, and also to strategic investors like you know, your corporations. So I look forward to this um, exciting panel today. Yeah, thank you for coming out today. Hope you guys are enjoying the conference. I'm John Ludington. I work with uh, Numeric Investors out of Boston. We're basically the quantitative equity arm of Man Group. If you're not familiar, they're a uh, larger in investment management firm based out of uh, London that has uh, exposure across a variety of different asset classes, um, in including global private markets. Looking forward to our, uh, uh, yeah, sharing our insights with you today. Hi, I'm William Bell. I uh, lead corporate development at Nuveen, which is a, you know, about a trillion dollars in asset, asset center management, the asset management arm of TIAA. We have about 200 billion in alternatives. The vast majority of that is actually in real estate, but we do private equity, alternative credit, um, infrastructure, and you know, just about everything else. Ah, excellent. And this is Eric. Eric. Yes. <laughs> uh, you made it just in <laughs> nick of time. Uh, um, would you introduce yourself? Certainly. Thank you so much. It's Veterans Day, so the traffic is uh, significant. My name is Eric Munson. I'm the founder and chief investment officer for Adit Ventures. We're a family office-owned late-stage venture firm based here in New York, offices in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, we've been doing it for about five years. I have over 35 years of experience. Excellent. So let me start with the question uh, that uh, everybody, even including myself, who is not part of the private equity MVC community, um, can see happening, which is large amounts of real money is flowing into private equity, particularly of late endowments, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, and so on, increasing their allocation to private equity and late stage VC. Um, why is this? Is this a function of capacity to absorb funds? Is this a function of better expected returns at this junction of time? Uh, or maybe something else? Um, uh, particularly later economic cycle and what, what, what not. What, what, what do you think? Start with Lemmy. I mean, I, I think the, one of the obvious things is just more of the metrics. Um, mm -hmm. Private equity in particular, uh, they've been outperforming the market. Um, there's been so many interesting sectors. So I, my viewpoint is really, you know, two things. And one is really access. So when you think of the real money investors like the you know, pension funds or sovereign wealth funds, they're trying to get into these businesses that are disruptive to their industries. And what better way to do that than you know, through private equity? So that's, that's my first uh, viewpoint. I mean, besides all the other you know, economic metrics that you look at. Um, the second thing I want to add is really on emphasis on allocating capital to um, more diverse firms. So I would say, you know, right now you have um, you know, a lot of um, private equity funds raising capital. So lots of them are minority-owned businesses, women-run firms. 
those are some of the people who get in allocations from um, the real money investors. So it's also something people are, are really talking about, but it's a huge play right now mm -hmm. in, in terms of diversity in, in the investment teams and how that works out. Interesting. Eric, from your perspective, what do you think? Well, the returns for private equity have outpaced the public markets substantially over history. And certainly today, with the demand in the pension fund world to meet actuarial assumptions uh, for endowments, the universities to keep up their uh, planned activities, be it renovating the infrastructure of a university or a college, or increase the quality of the student experience, they need these returns. And so the returns from the public markets have been, been very good over the course of the last decade since the economic recovery, but they have not you know, canceled economic cycles or market corrections. And I think that in the uh, private equity space, you're seeing people seek that alpha generation, which is harder to find in the hedge fund space, in the public market space, and many other asset classes. So we expect the, the, the cash flows and the allocations to continue to be fairly robust to private equity and, and other subsectors of private equity. Sure, yeah, so you guys have both mentioned performance. I think that's first and foremost probably the, the most important thing in an institution's mind, um, but not just the actual performance, but also risk-adjusted performance. When you, when you look at at least the reported risk numbers for private equity, obviously due to smoothing and less frequent market to market, it does look like a more diversifying asset class that is lower volatility, lower risk. So it's that risk-adjusted return, which also looks very, um, very attractive. Um, I'd say the other thing is, is, is just uh, with that less frequent marketing to market, the, uh, a CIO of a plan can kind of sleep better at night. They don't have to report to their board on why there was a large drawdown um, and say they're public equity funds. I think that's actually a very real factor with a lot of the institutional clients we work with. Um, you can point out some of the academic studies that say public and private, maybe, you know, depending on the different risk adjustments you make for sector and so on, um, maybe there isn't as much of a return premium, and they basically say we don't care, we sleep better at night. Uh, with you know, with smoothing. And William, from an in, in institutional investor's perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that's been said here. I think it's, you know, the institutional investors have a, a huge amount of capital that they need to deploy today. And, you know, when you're looking and you have high return thresholds you need to achieve, you're looking and see where that best opportunity is. Private equity has historically been one of those asset classes that has performed better than public market benchmarks. And so it's also been relatively uncorrelated and I think just given that, especially in the middle market sector, which is where we invest primarily, there's a lot more operational um, focus on the GP perspective and how they work with their portfolio companies. And through that, you should be able to weather um, down market cycles a little bit better and be able to structure your deals so that you can you know, ultimately create more value for your investors down the road. So I think all yeah. that. That all makes sense. Uh, so let me get tactical uh, given this introduction. So, um, so what is the current market uh, environment for private equity? On previous uh, panels, uh, the first panel, we heard about, okay, well, the cycle is getting long on the tooth. Uh, there's all kinds of indications of that. So how does that affect uh, all of this new money coming into private equity market? How does the debt markets uh, situation with very low yields and so on affect that uh, potentiality of uh, you know, recession not too far in the future? So what do you think about the, the tactical environment? Um, who wants to take first? Perhaps John? Uh, yeah. Sure, I think from a tactical standpoint, we obviously see uh, purchase price multiples of valuations at, at uh, record highs or close to record highs really over the last couple of years, um, which, which has helped drive the amount of dry powder. Really, it's, you know, those two go hand in hand in, in, in terms of what causes the other. But I think what you see is a lot of GPs are maintaining discipline around valuation or trying to, uh, which is um, with the fundraising environment, the massive amounts of money that have been coming into private equity. Obviously, there's more money to de be deployed, but if they're being patient and disciplined about valuation on the way in, then, um, then that, that money is building up. So you see record levels of dry powder right now. For broader private markets, many estimates are as high as $2 trillion. For the buyout space, which is what we're a little more focused on, um, you, you see numbers, anywhere, give or take, right around a trillion. So a lot of, there's certainly a lot of dry powder. 
um, helping to drive up valuations as, um, as you also see in a, a very large number of competitors. Uh, I've seen a stat that just um, in the last six years we've gone from uh, 6,300 different private equity uh, firms to 9,000. So it's been a, a massive, massive increase. Um, not all of them are actively investing, but it is a very large number uh, that are chasing what at the end of the day is a finite number of deals. And that's helping drive valuations up. William? Yeah, and, and, and I'd add to that. I think if you look at the opportunity set that's out there, particularly in the middle, middle market, You've, you've seen only about 4% of institutional penetration of ownership of these firms. And if you look at the intergenerational transfer of wealth that we're looking at, and particularly a lot of the businesses in the United States are owned by the boomer generation and are probably going to be looking to transition that at some point. And maybe, you know, not, not all of them will be transitioned through the family. So, you know, that creates a, a, a fairly robust opportunity for um, institutional investors like private equity firms to get in there. And even in this, the, the influx of capital and the proliferation of managers, you're still seeing entry multiples pretty manageable or you know depressed relative to um, other asset classes and you know in, in the public markets. And so, yeah, I think this is something that you know right now we re certainly recognize that's 10 years into a bull market, but you know there's no reason to suggest that that's going to end anytime soon. Um, oh, and one other thing too, I should mention. The, uh, the leverage ratios that we see nowadays are actually much more manageable than they were in 2007. So if you look at 2007, the debt to equity ratios in a lot of the private equity deals averaged around 60-40 debt to equity, and today it's about 50-50. So even though mu overall multiples have approached that level, um, the split is more manageable, and so you can kind of pr expect that there might be and, some more stability. And, and I would assume with much better cash coverage because the interest rates are so low. Correct. And, and I, I would say that given the fact that rates have dropped as much as they have, uh, the buyout space has a, has a chance to get leverage in their deals at very, very low, historically low rates. And therefore, you should see price multiples at all-time high levels. In fact, they're probably another 10% to move higher given the cost of capital these days and the fact that it's a much bigger economic base. You've got the U.S. consumer record levels of, of net worth higher than the last wave up. Um, you, you have the market selling at 17 times, which is not out of line on historical multiples, the public markets. You've got an asset class that's delivered almost twice the performance value with uh, uncorrelated returns, which I think is hugely important for most uh, plan sponsors and allocators. And you've got what we think looks to be a three to five year window of continued opportunities in, in certain select areas of private equity that we think offer tremendous growth, much better than the two or three percent uh, potential GDP growth that most people are forecasting for the overall U.S. economy. So a combination of cost of capital, uh, reasonable valuations, not cheap, but certainly in the realm of reality. And third, uh, excessive growth and opportunity set means that there's going to be continued demand and continued capital and continued activity in the space. One final note on the dry powder, I think you'll start to see, and we're seeing this already, uh, sponsors on one side selling a deal to, not to the public markets or to a strategic buyer, but back to another sponsor, another uh, private equity firm who thinks they can work their magic, eat operational, combine it with other companies, add some technology, they can make it better. And I think that there's some real truth to that, and you've seen a lot of s specialist firms stepping into things like uh, software as a service, for example, with nice recurring cash flows. So there's a lot of really compelling segments uh, that, that we think offer tremendous growth going forward. That last comment uh, is probably even more so uh, applicable to late stage VCs and uh, potentially exiting directly into some sort of strategic or some sort of even private uh, situation. I haven't seen any uh, VC into private deals yet, but uh, I don't know if there have been. But uh, Tom, Tom Brova took a $5 billion company uh, and, and bought it from another plan sponsor three weeks ago. So there's right. a real deals happening at right. the $5 billion size yeah. level and up. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to take a segue into the VC land. Sure. Uh, also, from a tactical point of view, where do you think the opportunities are in terms of sectors, in terms of placing capital structure? Uh, or earlier or later stages of the VC money. Um, and of course, you know, as we're talking VC, uh, we can't 
uh, avoid talking about uh, most recent, most, uh, you know, fireworks uh, around WeWork. So how does that affect? Is that a one-off? Is that a, a, you know, canary in a coal mine? What, whatever it is, what, 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 what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think uh, obviously WeWork is a, is a known disaster. Um, but to answer your first part of the question, I'm, I'm actually a big fan of more uh, recession-proof type um, se sectors. So if you think about your basic needs, uh, food, shelter, clothing, consumer-driven um, aspects, I, I think those are really great. And we've been seeing a lot of deal flow and activity uh, in, in that sector. Um, real estate and healthcare is always great. Um, I, I did a TV interview a couple of months ago talking about WeWork and the fact that, you know, they slashed the evaluation at the time. And, and obviously, as everyone's mentioned here, the key value that private equity funds bring it, besides, you know, capital to these companies is, you know, op operating efficiencies. So WeWork would have definitely benefited from improving their fundamentals and getting ready for an IPO, as we all know. And it, it's something to be said, um, just thinking about, you know, which sectors to go into besides technology. Um, you have to think about everything else. The founder is important. Um, their fundamentals is key. And, and then you kind of go ahead. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Here? Well, I think what you're seeing with, with venture capital, and particularly with WeWork, is that you know, a lot of these players, they're trying to reinvent entire industries, and there's been a huge amount of capital thrown at this idea, and we've seen this through where we are in the technological cycle. There's a lot of, you know, interesting innovations out there, particularly, you know, around AI and, you know, what that can do, but just even basic business process automation that you can see. And, you know, in terms of incumbents adopting that, it's often pretty difficult to do because you've basically got to create wholesale change that can result in a loss of and a lot of lost jobs that ultimately people are not going to want to, the, the expertise to evaluate the solutions are the people that are most at risk. So you, you see a lot of the excitement from that is about the new companies that are coming up, um, but you're just not going to see that they're going to be able to, you know, it, you're seeing a lot more investor scrutiny on the business models that these businesses have because a lot of times they're first developing a solution and then figuring out if there's a problem to be solved. And now, you know, that particularly with WeWork, you're starting to see that that's really not necessarily going to be the best way to get a business going. Yeah. I'll go ahead. We, we passed on WeWork five separate times. I, our nickname of the company in our offices is Won't Work. And it was billed, <laughs> sorry, it was billed to us as a technology company. And we looked at the company, and it did have some interesting. Uh, you know, metrics to it, fast growth, large corporate reach, but it had no technology advantage. There were no barriers to entry. There was no depth of management. There was no structure. There were no grown-ups in the room ever, clearly. And the bankers, be it Goldman or Morgan, uh, JP Morgan, were just enabling the company by loaning them money and, and uh, giving them these valuations. Even at $9 billion, we passed two or three weeks ago when they were recapitalizing the company because there's no barriers to entry. And if you are, in fact, talking about discipline that, that a firm brings as an asset management firm, be it in private equity, be it in venture capital, you have to impose that discipline in your portfolio. And, uh, you know, frankly, it's a good sign, in my opinion, that the market was able to discern that this is, you know, the emperor has no clothes. And the Masasan overpaid, grossly overpaid for Uber, for WeWork, and dozens of other deals. That's a fact today. Black and white, non-disputable. The guy with the biggest fund and the biggest checkbook was bumping the valuations up, and, and, and people thought he was a genius. No, he had a big checkbook. Uh, and, and, you know, that's the reality. And yes, there's tremendous opportunities in, in we think, in the venture capital space for people who are, as, as Bill mentioned, reinventing industries. Airbnb is likely to be a, a, have a direct listing at some point in the middle of next year. This is a company that's growing at 40% on a $5 billion revenue base. Seven and a half billion next year, 10 billion plus in 2021, with 50 to 70% net margins. 
They put up a button on their website two years ago for experiences that generated a billion dollars in revenue in less than 12 months. I wish I could put a button up on my website and put up a billion dollars of incremental revenue. They do have technology. They do have barriers to entry. They do have management teams in place and a treasury function. Uh, they don't have nine billion dollars of debt. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot of really positive things in the marketplace. Companies like Palantir, which are grossly misunderstood by the investment community as a, at large, uh, and, and, and the journalists cover it and talk about their ICE business as opposed to the, the uh, efficiencies that they generate. So we're really excited about the quality of companies and the quality of earnings coming from some of these companies. This is not a, an example of the dot-com era with the uh, Pets.com and the sock puppet here. These are real businesses with real companies and real revenues. In the case of Won't Work, it was simply poorly managed, had no governance, and got out over its skis with $9 billion in debt. And the market recognized that. That's a positive thing. We are not in the rising tides lifting all boats. The boats have to be seaworthy vessels. And in that case, it wasn't. Just that simple. Yeah, I agree. I mean, whenever you see the markets actually working by themselves without I don't know, SEC getting involved or whoever else, uh, that's a positive sign. That's, that's healthy, uh, and hopefully that's a sign that perhaps uh, markets are not quite that frothy yet, uh, as you say. Um, having said that, uh, while you know, SoftBank did have a large pocketbook or checkbook, uh, the market as a whole, in aggregate, has even larger one, and I think that's the struggle that when, when you have to allocate quite so much capital and as uh, John mentioned, still limited number of, uh, of final opportunities, whether you want it or not, uh, it will have to be some sort of you know, reversion to mean, so to speak. You, you will have to uh, diversify and you know, pick a few not so good ones together with the best ones, right? And that's probably applicable not just to VCs, to, to, to PE, um, or for that argument for anyone else. No, I, I think that's a good point. And when you're you know, comparing VCs and private equity funds, I think for many of the deals that I see at least, the issue is really control, right? Can you really take a stance? Because VCs usually take on minority investments, even if they have big checkbooks whereas private equity funds take majority, so they have access to actual operating um, uh, the business, and, and that makes a big difference. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, uh, can I sort of tweak the question slightly differently? Let's go from tactical to slightly more uh, uh, outlook. Like, what do you think is the outlook for the next decade? What do you think is the outlook starting from wherever we are now um, uh, for both private equity and VC, let's say, for whether it's still this cycle or this over to into the next cycle, but uh, are people to sort of maybe even challenge a little bit the point that uh, several of you have made that yes, private equity has outperformed uh, other markets historically, and yes, if I am a pension fund, if I allocate to private equity, I get to mark my expected returns a little higher. Are those expected returns expected to realize? I can take the first stab. I think you probably are looking at attractive returns on a going forward basis still, um, but not as attractive as you've seen over the last decade or so. Um, and it's not even the dry powder so much. It's basically like two years of uh, of dry powder at, at a normal um, rate of rate of investment. It's actually more the valuations. I mean, when you look when you look at at what the best leading indicators are of future performance of private equity, valuations are key. I mean, that's a big that multiple expansion that you see in companies is a key driver of returns. And here you are at you know, roughly 12.9 uh, enterprise value to EBITDA multiples. So on the purchase price, so. Um, yeah, you're probably looking at an environment over the next 10 years that isn't quite as attractive as the last 10 years, but it's not to say it's not attractive at all. Yeah, I would agree on, on the multiples, on, on John's point, because you do see really high multiples, high EBITDA multiples at this point. And um, if you do a quality of earnings analysis, for instance, on some of these companies, they're actually using 
more of the projections, more of the growth of the businesses. So it also increases the multiples. And as you're saying, the market sees this. And at some point, there's going to be a little bit of a correction. So it might not be as attractive as the last five, 10 years, but we, we, we should expect more of a realistic valuation going forward. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really high competition for assets at this point that we're seeing and really high multiples. And I don't know how long that trend can continue, but at, at some point I would think it would start to decline. Maybe I just add just one quick, um, I don't know if anybody reads PitchBook data, but when they put out their third quarter report uh, a few what, a few weeks ago, a few, couple months ago, whenever, um, they, they, they actually did a survey of, um, of limited partners and found that actually a lot of institutional limited partners have the same expectation of, of a lower return in the next 10 years as the past 10 years, but it doesn't mean they're not continuing to plow money into the space. But potentially, I mean, comparatively, it might be lower in absolute terms, but comparatively still healthy compared to other alternatives, perhaps. I mean, any, any other views? If, uh, if not, I'll, I'll actually want to... Well, we, we have a strong view on the venture space over the next 10 years, and mm -hmm. I think there is going to be a paradigm shift. Um, I don't sp play in the buyout space, real estate, other things. That's not my world. But in the venture space, I think there's tremendous change happening in the economy, tremendous change happening in the medical. Uh, immunomedics is going to change the way medicine is practiced around the world. The information technology techniques and, and tools we're using now are, are increasing the pace of so many things. Uh, what we have now with our voice actuation for Siri and things like that is a joke compared to where it's going to be in five or ten years. The autonomous vehicles, the drone deliveries, all of these, you know, Jetson-like visions of the future are in fact happening right now, today. And that's going to be materially recognized in terms of efficiencies and operating margins and profits and revenue growth and efficiency improvements over the next decade. So yeah, you may see some softness in the middle. Ideally, as a plan, as, as, a, uh, as a sponsor of a fund, we can take the capital in, take advantage of the softness of the market, put that capital to work over time at an attractive valuation, and then see the acceleration out of the economic uh, downturn and, and show really good results over the next 10 years. That's the ideal situation. Yeah, I mean, I think that you'll definitely see a pretty dramatic transformation. I agree with you completely that we're in the midst of a pretty dramatic change in the way that technology impacts our lives, and you're seeing it, you know, in the early stages right now in just automation, looking at, you know, cars these days, and, you know, most of them are have some of, of it, capability of autonomous driving, whether it's just staying in your lane or slowing down and doing sort of a managed cruise control. Um, and that capability is only going to continue to accelerate. And what you could see, though, is you know something that we haven't really seen before, which is really massive scale automation. And you're looking at not just sort of routine, low level jobs, but even up into a lot of white collar professions that people are going to be really impacted by the you know, what technology is going to be able to do. And I think we're still probably very early stages on this, and the technology, for a lot of reasons, isn't quite there to be able to provide that level of role automation. It's much more focused on particular task automation, and you might, you know, every time this has happened, right, you, there's plenty of discussion around, you know, whether technology actually reduces jobs every time it actually has come about. It's actually increased employment. This time may be different. We don't know. Um, but I think that could... That, that's the one of the big uncertainties for what the future 10 years are going to look like because, yeah, I agree with you, you're going to see continued good returns on capital probably going forward. It'll probably be less given the amount of capital that's flown into the markets these days. But what's going to happen from that sort of underlying impact to employment and how that's going to ultimately feed into our economy, which relies on sort of a diffuse um, platform of wealth that people are able to spend into and create economic activity. That's sort of something that I think leaves a lot of questions. That, those are really good uh, comments. I, I would actually, uh, you know, uh, from, from a perspective of somebody who is just pure quant and trading vol and such, I, I would agree with you that probably the ideal situation is to enter with plenty of cash into upcoming recession right now because there is nothing like a positive volatility exposure of cash in a sense of you being able to take advantage of you know new opportunities that that come in and you know historically if you try to raise cash when that already happens that would be too late so in in some ways perhaps that's a silver lining of 
P values being too high right now, which is as you raise money and over the next 10 years as you deploy it, there will be some sort of dollar cost averaging going on. If, if you've got insights into when the next downturn is, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, nobody can, but uh, that, that's, why, that's why the long cycle of private equity and VC perhaps allows you to take advantage of that uh, slightly better than you know, somebody like me who has to actually trade around it, right? So, uh, and that actually brings me to the question of perhaps uh, discussing structural advantages of uh, private equity and VC, this being one of them, but maybe there are others that really make it really alternative, not just a different way of making a deal, but just structurally a different thing uh, compared to investing in public markets or compared to you know, other alternative investments in hedge funds or you name it. Um, what would you, what would you uh, name as a true structural advantage of private equity and VC? Yeah. I'll start on that. I mean, I think one of the, the major structural advantages of private equity versus the public markets is just the number of opportunities that you have. And I think the number of um, private companies, I don't have the exact stat in my head, but I know there's about 10,000 publicly listed equities across the globe, and that's a remarkably small number. And so if you think about the number of small, business, small and medium-sized businesses that are out there, there's just a much, much wider opportunity set that private equity can tap into. And on top of that, then you get, you know, a lot of these businesses, they've been run well, but call it well enough because they're a lot of times family-owned and they've been doing well for, the, for that family, but then you bring in some institutional ownership that opens up a whole new set of uh, tools at their disposal for how they can create value and, you know, either creating scale or operational improvements or what have you that will ultimately then lead to higher returns down the road. And, you know, I think there's still, at, we're still early innings just given the, you know, the stat I cited earlier, about 4% institutional ownership in these small and medium-sized businesses that you could probably see a lot of improvement in the way businesses are run um, going forward. You know, I think the time horizon is a huge, another huge structural advantage. You know, if you take any asset class and you give someone a seven to ten year time horizon versus seven to ten weeks or seven to ten months, you have a much higher probability of generating positive returns over a seven to ten year period. It's just a given. It's just that simple. Uh, I think the other fact is, the, is, is that uh, you've got a tremendous amount of ability to get information, and, and as one of my other panelists pointed out, have some, affect some control, change the business, as opposed to being a minority shareholder in a public company where you can go up and make a proposal at the annual meeting and try to get something done. Whereas if you're a private equity sponsor and you own a third of the company and control a third of the debt, the board of directors are going to listen to what you have to say and will probably implement some of the strategic uh, initiatives you put forth to help them become more profitable and become more successful. So those are very different things. And the third differentiation is the fact that information flows are different under the public market scenarios versus private markets. And if you're intelligent and strategic and savvy, you can take advantage of that as a private company or as a private company investor. And that's, those are three fundamentally different approaches. Definitely. I would want to connect uh, two dots that you voiced in the last couple of questions. One is the still coming automation and still coming transformation of a lot of segments of the business and basically technology entering new places and automating new places where it hasn't done so yet. Um, and if you reflect on that, uh, technology typically, as uh, William mentioned before, uh, technology typically works better on a smaller scale enterprise just because they need it more as opposed to incumbents that there is a lot of difficulties, right? So perhaps private equity slash later stage VCs, that's one thing that, uh, that they can actually do with the impact of technology of helping all of these much bigger scale of private companies to become technologically advanced and competitive with the larger enterprises on one hand and globally on the other hand, which both of them are huge expansion opportunities. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think technology is a big driver 
Um, but I, I also think innovation is more of the bigger driver. It could be in technology or it could be in other aspects of the business. And when I mentioned earlier, um, having access to this kind of companies or industries that are disruptive, innovation is really what you're looking for. And that's what the VCs and the private equity funds pretty much help these companies with. And if you really think about the world we're living in right now where there's not just a you know, demographic shift, there's also like a psychographic shift. Consumers want what they want right now. Like I pretty much buy everything on Amazon, like, and I want it today. So you have to think about companies that are ahead of the curve and really you, can't, you might not be able to get that in public markets right away. It takes time and it takes investing in R&D and product development and that's where the PEs and I think the, the VCs also come into play. Um, I think we have a couple more minutes. I wanted to touch on uh, two sort of tangential uh, topics. One. Um, uh, there has been a lot, you mentioned it actually in the very first question, is there has been a lot of emphasis on ESG, sustainability and so on in public markets investing. Does that have any sort of, uh, I, perhaps more in VC world, but in private equity world, do you see any sort of uh, effect of that uh, in, in, in this market? We see tremendous interest from investors focused on uh, basic fundamental principles, you know, environmental standards, be, being good stewards, stewards of, our, uh, of your community, of your company, of your constituency, of your customer base, and of your employees, and of the community at large. Very, very important. The sustainability element is huge. The scalability element is huge. And governance, we just looked at won't work, and the lack of governance there is a blatant example of the problems you can have if you don't have someone running the show and being responsible. So I think that those fundamental principles, by whatever name you want to call them, are inherent in any investment decision, in the public markets, in the private markets, in uh, buyouts land, in, in the venture world, all over the bet. You have to make, be cognizant of those. And in the public markets, companies trade at a premium or a discount because of the responsibility of, of the founders and of the, uh, of the managers. So I think it's becoming uh, built into the, the price of these companies, and it's very, it's, the market is becoming self-regulating to a certain extent. The days of Exxon dumping oil in Valdez disaster and, and continuing on its merry way are gone forever. I think just, <clears throat> just from a structural standpoint, the control advantage that private equity investors often have with, with these companies uh, allows them to be more engaged uh, shareholders. So, yeah, I, I think there is more opportunity for them to, to be active on, on E, S, or G are all three of the po uh, policies. You're also seeing large managers like TPG and KKR and, and us too are launching impact-focused uh, private equity style funds and looking to use private equity dollars in the style of investing to not only to have sort of a double bottom line return of both you know profits as well as social good created out of it. And uh, I think that's a model you're going to see you know continue to develop. And there's opportunities both in domestically here and sort of investing in low-income communities. You also see it in uh, emerging markets and being able to help those economies grow through targeted investments in smaller businesses that need capital to grow and um, can, you know, benefit from professional man managerial talent or, you know, just looking at, looking at it from a, you know, an investor lens who, you know, can give access to networks that people may not have previously had access to. So, you know, there's, there's tremendous opportunity in that. That's good to know. Um, uh, in closing, maybe uh, I'll, I'll just uh, take a question from the audience. Uh, yes. I would actually agree with you on that. On the first point, uh, most of our business is in public equities, and uh, we observed the exact same thing. But uh, the lack of correlation to my comments before about market to market and smoothing and so on, or less frequent market to market for private equity. Um, we actually went through an interesting exercise, just a hypothetical exercise at the company, where we took one of our portfolios. We only mark to market when we actually transacted in the stock, either bought or sold it. That simple act of basically a, 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 a homemade way of smoothing uh, literally brought our beta down to, uh, but cut it by more than 50%, brought it right in line with private equity. So it's literally just artificial, it's artificial numbers, <laughs> to your point. We did a little work on our venture portfolio for some of those same reasons you mentioned. I can't speak to the private equity world at large, but in the venture space, there definitely is a far lower correlation. And what we found is that 
about 70% of venture-backed deals don't go to the public markets, don't go to the capital markets. They go IPO or direct listing, a small minority do, but 70 plus percent get bought by other companies, strategics, um, other people like that. And so therefore, we're, we're, we're significantly less correlated and there's a lot less volatility with a much higher alpha in the venture space. We, I did some work actually at Oxford's Said School with uh, Professor Tim Jenkins on that effect. And the, Yep. Well, I'm glad you mentioned tax reasons because that's, uh, that's always the real savings for a lot of private equity deals. True. Um, do we have time for one, one more question? Yeah. Yes. Right. Thank you for the discussion this morning. Um, do the existence of extremely low interest rates fuel the development of private equity ventures that uh, perhaps should not be done otherwise? I mean, it's, it's, it stands to reason that there's probably some deals that shouldn't have been done or that, that are getting done that shouldn't have been get, shouldn't get done. I think what you've got to do is, you know, from our perspective, we try to curate a, a, a really good list of managers that we invest with that we, you know, know have invested well throughout different market cycles and have maintained, you know, pretty strong investment discipline. So, um, and I think, you know, if you look at on the venture side, right, you've seen, plenty of companies out there with 10 U.S. at best business models. I think we work as a prime example of that. And, you know, there's, there's countless others that are, you know, probably looking at public markets and, you know, the IPO process and seeing that institutional investors are actually demanding to see a pathway towards profitability or at least, you know, favorable unit economics. And those, you know, and a lot of companies just aren't there. Thank you. I think we'll wrap up. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And thank you for the panel. Thank you.